This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 562, recorded on August 6th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are recording at Rutgers University in New Jersey. This is the Cook campus of Rutgers, and I have with me two regular hosts, Dixon de Pommier. Well, Vincent. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. And Brianne Barker. Hello. Good to be here. Who, you, who didn't come from far, right? Madison, New Jersey? Madison, New Jersey. Just How long a quick is it? trip down 287. Mm, half an hour, 40 minutes. I live in exit one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. I live at exit 15, sorry, on the turnpike. How long did it take you to get here? Uh, well, I got here so early, I didn't know how long it was going to take, so I got here at 9.30, so... I was an hour early, so I went out and found a McDonald's, bought a large coffee, and sat down and listened to NPR and got totally depressed. It was all about the IPPC. You, the, you should have listened to TWIV or TWIM I or TWIP I or TWIVO or Immune. This is true. Do you know how to listen to podcasts, Dixon? I do. In fact, I know how to make them, too. Okay. Very good. Well, you know, thank you for coming. I listened to the episode about mitoviruses, so I was caught up for this. Yeah, that's a good one. So he can fix everything there we said go. wrong, right? Exactly. Well, there we go. All right. So we are here It'll take at a long Rutgers time. because there is virology in New Jersey. Who would have thunk, right? I mean, I always knew there was virology in Princeton, there's virology in Newark, and of course, I always knew there was virology here as well. And we're finally here. I've been wanting to come here for a long time. So we have four virologists as guests today, and they are professors in various departments. Uh, on my right is the person who invited me to come here. He is in, well, I might get your departments wrong because often the website is wrong, so you correct me. Plant biology and pathology? Yeah, they, they dropped the pathology, so now it's just, uh, just plant, plant biology. biology. Sadly, for those of us who are pathologists. All right, and you're also the director of the New Jersey Agricultural Experimental Station. That's right, that's my day job. Brad Hillman, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. And you were the person who said we should come here. I absolutely did. So I hope you're excited about it, and uh, we're going to showcase... Rutgers. It's been a great visit so far. Thank you all, the three of you, for coming down. My pleasure. You know, we were in, what's the name of your hall? Martin Hall? Martin Hall. We started there at the Waxman Room. The Waxman Room. Uh, Did you see the Waxman Room? I have not seen uh, the Waxman Room. Oh, it's very room cool. She'll, she'll see it on the way back. This is original lab. It's like a museum. They have artifacts <laughs> downstairs. Uh, also joining us uh, from Marine and Coastal Sciences, Kay Beidel. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Right department. Happy to be here. The right department. Yep. Exactly. Who, if you're listening, you don't know this, but he has a Band-Aid on his head because he's a surfer. <laughs> That's right. And uh, surfers do that, right? Yeah, surfers, yeah, we, we tend to get injured. You know? What did you hit? Or eat my board. Your board, okay. Yeah, so I had, I had dropped in, uh, you know, was, you know, having a good ride and then um, wiped out and I felt my board on my face. So dr this so, word drop in, what does that mean? You go into the wave? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you drop into the form of the wave. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and then, yeah, and then I, I was going to go back out, and then one of my fellow surfers told me that I was bleeding profusely. <laughs> and so I looked down, and yeah, I was covered in blood. So. You get stitches? Uh-huh, I have seven stitches. They'll come out right. on Friday. All right. I'm where sorry. Did, to... Where did you go surf? Seagirt, Spring Lake. Are yeah. you familiar with the Jersey Shore? I am. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, it's a good scene down there. Well, welcome to TWIV. And Thank you. From, uh, did I say you were from Marine and Coastal Sciences? I think I did. Yes. Right? Also from Marine and Coastal Sciences, Kim Thamatracon. <laughs> Tamatracon. Tamatracon. There you go. Tamatracon. I need 10 minutes. Tamatracon. Don't look at it. Well, welcome. Just listen to it. It's <laughs> a matra a lot of silent letters. So the cologne, K-O-L-N at the end, it's like cologne, right? If it were German, it would be cologne. <laughs> sure. But it's not German. <laughs> I think I actually say it wrong. I pronounce it incorrectly. 
according what, to my mother. What's the right way? I, I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I won't look to Matracon. Yeah. Is that good? That's Welcome good. to TWIV. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And from um, ev Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources, Siobhan Duffy, welcome. Hi. How are you? I've seen Siobhan multiple times, but I've not met any of these other participants, so uh, that's always fun. And we've been wanting to get here for a while. And we have a little audience. What are you guys, like graduate students, postdocs, a mix, yes? yes. You study viruses? Yes. Who doesn't? Oh. <laughs> I know you study fun fungi of uh, hazelnuts, yes. right? And uh, you do communications over there, right? Which is cool also. Very good. And you're all, uh, others are virologists. There's some undergrads here too. There are undergrads? How many? Oh, good. All right. You're working, are you working in labs over the summer? I saw you in the lab. Did I see you? Okay. And uh, whose lab are you in? Siobhan's, the one we visited. So we visited Siobhan's lab where they're evolving phages, right? Okay. That's pretty cool. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, before we get going, if you like our podcast, please consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We'll tell you more about that down at the bottom. I always love to start TWIVs with guests to find out about um, a little bit about your history. Let's start with you, Brad. Sure. Are you from New Jersey? I'm not. I'm from Arizona. Grew up in Tucson. Uh, child of, a, uh, of an academic, an agricultural economist at the University of Arizona, uh, and uh, left, the, uh, left Tucson for the Bay Area. Uh, and good choice. <laughs> well, I, st I started as an astronomy major at the University of Arizona. It's a great place. For that. Uh, it's oh, a great oh. place for that. <laughs> and unfortunately, my brain and the brains of the astronomers, it's a great place for astronomy. So there are a lot of smart people there. And my, my brain just didn't think the way their brains thought about numbers. Uh, and, and so anyway, I uh, ended up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I ended up uh, going to the University of California at Berkeley uh, as an undergraduate and got interested in virology there as a, uh, uh, as for an undergraduate research project uh, with Jack Morris, um, who was a terrific uh, all around virologist. He was working on plant viruses and also doing some projects on insect viruses at the time. And so I got into his lab as an undergrad and started working on uh, some of those sort of fun projects uh, and ended up essentially staying with him. I, I uh, worked for him as, as a technician for a little while uh, and then went into graduate school and uh, got a master's and PhD uh, with him. Uh, stayed there uh, a little bit longer for convenience reasons uh, because my daughter had uh, just been born, and somebody that I really wanted to do a postdoc with, who's uh, a very uh, good plant virologist, Andy Jackson, uh, had recently moved from Purdue to Berkeley. And so I'd wanted to do a postdoc with Andy anyway, and, and so Andy came to Berkeley, and so I'm like, well, I got to do it here then. Uh, so I was with him working on uh, rhabdoviruses, working on the plant rhabdovirus that he works on uh, for... Uh, just a short time, I was with him for about nine months. I had already set up a postdoc out here uh, at what used to be the Roche Institute of Molecular Biology uh, in, in Nutley, uh, New Jersey. It was there on the Roche campus before the Roche campus got paved. Um, it was a wonderful place to, to do that kind of work. So the, the person that I really wanted to do a postdoc with besides Andy was uh, Don Ness, who had just started at uh, Roche. He had, he had come down from uh, New York Public Health uh, to, to start at, at Roche, just as Aaron Shatkin was, was leaving uh, Roche to come to Rutgers. Um, and so I was with Don for about a year and a half. Uh, and uh, postdocs weren't paid very much at Roche at the time. Uh, my children by that time, too, were getting hungry. Uh, and, and so as, as academic jobs sort of started to present themselves. Uh, I applied for a few, and the one that I uh, ended up coming to was, was here at Rutgers, and so I've been here for 30 years. Would you say you're a virologist? Uh, I'm 
absolutely a virologist. Are you kidding? Uh, so, so uh, yes, I've meandered into fungi, uh, and, and so, so we definitely do uh, fungi because you you start to work on your host, you know. And so, so when I was in Don's lab, uh, uh, that was the first time I had worked with fungi. Um, but so when I was in his lab was. Uh, when we were really just getting to be able to sort of do anything with viruses of of fungi, so his his lab is the one that really sort of put that capability on the map with with infectious clones for the first time of a of a fungal virus and stuff like that, and and so, but you know then you as somebody who's uh, trained in molecular virology, you you sort of meander into the host and and so. Uh, you, you sort of have to work on the host to an extent, and so started to, to work on Cryphonectria uh, parasitica, the chestnut blight fungus, as a host. But then uh, some other fungi came along and, and have done some projects associated with them, uh, including uh, Calatotricum, uh, which is something that came to be Calatotricum cereal, which is a, an important pathogen of turf grass. Uh, so we did some kind of cool stuff on that, but don't work on it anymore. And as um, Alana said, we work on uh, the the hazelnut uh, eastern filbert blight fungus now uh, as well. Uh, Anisogramma anomala is the name of that organism, which is a pain to work with, a sounds, huge, sounds huge like a genome. pain to pronounce also. It, oh, it rolls off your tongue <laughs> once, you, once you get there. Uh, and, and also uh, Phytophthora uh, infestans, which is not a fungus, but is fungus-like. And, and a lot of the, it's a stromenopyle, an oomycete. And so uh, viruses of, of oomycetes are really similar to viruses of fungi in a lot of ways. And, and so we started working on some of those because uh, I, I, had a, um, I, I had an association with a postdoc at um, uh, Cornell uh, who uh, worked from a large culture collection of uh, Phytophthora infestans, and so we kind of said, let's look for viruses here and, and see if we can uh, find anything that affects the biology. And the four viruses that we found and characterized, only one of the four, uh, two of them are really interesting virologically, and there's a long way to go to toward their complete uh, characterization. Uh, but uh, one, only one of them uh, affects biology of, of Phytophthora, and that does not uh, suppress uh, virulence, but rather it, it increases sporulation. So you have the virus present, Phytophthora sporulates more, so it may add to fitness of uh, Phytophthora, and that, that work is actually just out now. Can you remember how long ago you wanted to do science? What was the impetus? Uh, uh, I wanted to do science, I think, for s sort of growing up. I think, I think all the way along in, in the sense of, um, frankly, I wanted to do science because I thought it was, it was great to know stuff. Uh, and, and so I thought it was, you know, I, w I wasn't a natural uh, academic or anything like that. I was a crappy student because I, I just didn't pay attention. And I, I like to be outside and, you know, run in the dirt in Tucson and stuff. Um, but I, I, really, um, I really respected uh, scientists and people who knew stuff. And I think especially then I, when, I, when I was at Berkeley uh, and I started taking uh, classes in plant pathology and in things that involved cell biology and stuff like that, so, like I, I didn't know how stuff worked. Uh, and, and so it was that sort of curiosity about how stuff worked, especially inside the cell. And so I took uh, a couple of interesting virology courses, one from Arthur Knight, who was one of Wendell Stanley's students, uh, and another, you're going to recognize this name, uh, from a, a guy who's uh, in the National Academy named Peter Duisberg, um, <laughs> who uh, is... A, a bit of a controversial figure. Anyway, <laughs> he was he was an interesting guy to have as a uh, professor. But in, so in those cases, and then as I started to work in Jack's lab, I, I really 
wanted to know how stuff worked. And so to know how stuff worked, uh, a good place to start is viruses. Uh, so you have to kind of start to understand how viruses work, but you can't understand how viruses work until you understand how cells work. Uh, and, and so then you start to understand how cells work. And, and then my interest, again, from having Jack as, as a mentor who is just sort of all over the place in his interests, you're like, well, what's the difference between being a plant virus and being an insect virus? Or, or being a mouse virus? Or being a fungus virus? You know, what, what do you have to be? What problems do you have to solve? So it's those kinds of things. And so that's, that's the kind of sort of, I think, in, inquisitive part of science that, that made me continue to enjoy it and to continue to, to sort of do what we do now. Okay, where are you from? I'm from Maryland. Maryland. Yeah. Went, born, grew, grew up there, high school? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Maryland. I grew up in a town called Severna Park, which is um, across the Severn River from Annapolis. So um, I grew up in, on the water, um, in the water, sailing, crabbing, um, swimming, doing all kinds of just connecting with, with the Chesapeake Bay estuary. Um, and so my, my interest in science really started from that point. Um, and, you know, interacting with friends and just, you know, wanting to get to know organisms. Um, and so, yeah, so I went to high school there. I went to the University of Maryland. Um, College Park, right? Uh, Baltimore County. Baltimore, so I'm a okay. retriever. So that's the <laughs> Honors College. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I asked because we were, we, were in, uh, we were in College Park last summer for a, a virology meeting. But okay. that's not where you went to school. No, no, no. I had, um, I've had collaborators there, but that's not where I went yeah, to school. Okay. Um, and, and I majored in biological sciences. Um, I was a student athlete as well. I, um, UMBC is a Division I school, so I played both. I was recruited for soccer, and I also played lacrosse there too. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, that was important in terms of shaping my discipline in terms of balancing academics and athletics. I've always been really interested in sports of all kinds, as and surfing, of course, is one of those too. Gives you good leadership qualities, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, I loved, I traveled abroad playing soccer in England a few times when I was a kid, and I was a, our team's captain, and we stayed with, um, with other families, host families, and that, you know, those were transformative experiences. Um, and so after, after University of Maryland, after I graduated, I worked as a, as a technician at the Center of Marine Biotechnology, which is now called the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology. It's in Baltimore. It's in the Columbus Center. It's right down in the Inner Harbor. Um, some of you probably see it, the, the Columbus Center. It's a building that looks has a big sail. Um, and that's really where I started my foray into marine microbiology. When I, when I had graduated from from Maryland, I didn't really take any formal microbiology classes, you know, it was genetics and, you know, classic biological sciences. And so I started working for a marine microbiologist. I told her, you know, I, I think I'm underqualified, you know, she said, you're going to do great. You know, when can you start? <laughs> and so, um, so I worked there for a few years and then I, I got interested in, in marine microbiology, like I said. And I went, I left Maryland and, and went out to California, to La Jolla, California, where I got my PhD at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It's affiliated with UC San Diego. Um, and I worked, studied under a visionary man um, who I got his work, I, I got to know when I was um, in Maryland. His name is Farouk Azam. Um, I don't know if you mm -hmm. come across him, but so, sure. Farouk was, um, we call him a visionary because I think he's one of the only people that has been able to get what we call an impressionist version of the microbial loop, this scribble um, on an overhead that we were working on in his office one time, and it got into science. Um, and so his, his idea and his passion was diving into the microscale and really trying to get a sense of what microbes experience in the relevant scale that they occupy, whether it's phytoplankton or viruses or, or bacteria, some of which have behavior and some of which are dependent upon physics and, and passive sort of distribution of which viruses are. And so, um, so while I was there, I, I studied the interaction of, 
um, marine bacteria with diatoms, which are silicious unicellular um, phytoplankton. And I was looking at that um, interaction as it relates to the importance of the global carbon and silica cycles. Um, and what was really interesting in my work was it, it really, um, it, it was dependent upon um, diatoms dying upon death. And I, I really, really got interested in cellular mechanisms by which uh, phytoplankton and microbes die in, in the oceans. Um, the subcellular pathways and the implication for that. And, and why that's interesting is because, um, so the oceans and, and terrestrial systems both fix the same amount of carbon on the planet. So it's about 50% primary productivity. But if you look at their standing stock biomass, um, the oceans only have about 1% of the standing stock biomass. So those ratios, that product, uh, productivity to biomass ratios, means that the oceans turn over once every two weeks, the biomass. And contrast that with terrestrial systems, it's once every two decades. Um, and that's primarily because there's a lot of recalcitrant carbon, like lignin and cellulose and things like that. But, but it really Im it implicates... Um, turnover and dynamic death processes. And so that's when I started to get into that. And um, Brad was saying that viruses are a nice way to sort of dive into subcellular processes where viruses are often implicated as the primary killers and mechanisms of death in the oceans. And so I had come uh, from Scripps to Rutgers. I did a postdoc with another visionary, uh, Paul Falkowski, um, and so I, I studied under him. He was, so we were looking at the activation of program cell death pathways, their relationship to apoptotic pathways that are in higher eukaryotes like us, um, and how, you know, through that work, we were able to show that there's a um, sort of an ancestral lineage of program cell death related molecular machinery that's been in the oceans for a long time. Um, phytoplankton have several billion year evolutionary histories. Um, and so just the, the specific pieces and how it's activated are just a little different than, than how it is in our bodies. It's very um, con controlled and complicated, but there are functional similarities. And so my foray into viruses and marine virology was at that interface, was looking how viruses interact with those pathways and how, if and how they're actually responsible for the um, massive turnover of organic matter in the ocean and how that impacts food webs, um, the, the ocean's carbon cycle, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you were a postdoc here? I was a postdoc here at Rutgers. And then stayed yeah. on as faculty? Yep. How long, yeah, I was able to get a faculty that? position. I started on the uh, faculty in 2005, I guess it was. It's hard to remember, actually. So I've been here for about 14 <laughs> Years, okay. which is amazing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We, Dixon and I have been longer. <laughs> Not here, but right? Quite a bit. How many years were you at Columbia? I started in 1971 as a faculty member, but I actually started there as a technician in 1962. So that's probably more than anybody here was even haploid. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went to Columbia in 82, and you mentioned salaries. And you're going to outdo me, it? Dixon, <laughs> of students and postdocs. I was a, my student stipend oh. was $6,000, right. PhD, and my postdoc was 12000 What about you? I don't remember what my stipend was for, uh, for my career at Notre Dame as a graduate student. Probably zero. No, no, no. I was on an American Chemical Society yeah. scholarship, so they had a lot of money in those days. And in fact, I was sitting in my... Uh, um, my mentor's office when he got a call from the National Institutes of Health and they asked him whether or not he was willing to accept some money because they wanted to start a new program. And you know, that's just the opposite of what you get today, of course. And then when I was at Rockefeller, I think the most I ever got was about 12000 a year or something like that. Oh. But, but what did a ride on the subway <laughs> cost back then? I right. have to index this. Probably, no, 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 it's definitely inflation for sure. And it might, it, it, the stipends are probably equivalent nowadays, but Still, overall, it's pretty crappy. Yeah. The one, the one area that's really improved is the residence salaries for medical schools. Medical, yeah. When they get a job as a resident now, they get actual money, <laughs> not just mm -hmm. the promise of money. They get a decent salary. So that, that's changed a great deal over the time. What was your 
first salary as an assistant professor? It was at the Medical College of Ohio in Toledo. Right. And I got, uh, I doubled the amount of money that 24, I got at, at Rockefeller. I got $23,000 or something like that. Yeah. So. I, I, I think inflation covers a bit, but True. still they're pretty low salaries in the scheme of yeah. the world. Yeah, we don't do this for the money. No, we don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, everybody. You yes, don't do it for don't. the money. But, but my, first, my first tuition at Berkeley was $112, too. Oh, right. So there wasn't a lot to pay back. Right. Wow. Per semester? Wow. They were on the that's, quarter system. That's so it was amazing. $112 a quarter. Yeah. Oh, boy. So I went to a local Jersey school, Fairleigh Dickinson, for my undergraduate, and it was $800 a semester. So I could easily make that in the summer. My parents agreed to pay half. I paid half. So that's how that worked out. Kim, where are you from? California. California. What part? Huntington Beach. <laughs> this is L.A. area, right? No. Where is Huntington <laughs> Beach? South, <laughs> you don't say that to somebody from Huntington <laughs> Beach. <laughs> where is it? South of L.A., halfway between L.A. and San Diego. Ah. Okay. Surfing capital of the world, but I do not surf. <laughs> Hence, I have no scars on my face. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you ever surf uh, uh, K in Huntington Beach? I have surfed in Huntington Beach okay. because I have family that live in Huntington Beach. Okay. Um, so I do know that it's the surf. It's surf city. Yeah. All right. I didn't know this, obviously. Um, so you grew up there, went to high school? Yep. Huntington Beach? Ocean View High School. And when did science come into your uh, awareness? So I think, so growing up, I wanted to be a pediatrician. Uh -huh. um, and I... Yeah, I really enjoyed like hanging out with kids and, you know, that was sort of my mentality when I went to college. So I went to uh, University of California, San Diego, um, and I got my undergraduate degree in biochemistry and cell biology. And I took my first mammalian physiology class my sophomore year of college and said, nope, that's not for me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> that was when that was when medical doctor went out the door and, you know, growing up as a first generation of Chinese immigrants, that was a big letdown to my parents is, mm -hmm. you know, you're supposed to be a doctor. But uh, yeah, so I graduated um, from UCSD and a little bit like Brad, I had not such great grades because I was more interested in being outside and doing things that 19 year olds want to do. Uh, so after I finished, I went, I got a job, I had a, I had a short, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. so. I had done research at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, at, um, working in a developmental neurobiology lab. So I knew how to do sort of bench work. So I went and got a job with a biotech company in the Bay Area, I moved to the Bay Area. Um, and they were part of the first human genome sequencing project. And I worked for three months there. I was in charge of the robots. So I got to watch the, <laughs> the robots that spotted the DNA onto the membrane. And I got, to, I got to scan the UPC code of the membranes into the computer and then switch out the membranes. <laughs> and so, and after a couple of months, I thought, man, I didn't go to college to do this. <laughs> So I, uh, I was fortunate I found a job as a researcher, as a, as a lab technician at Stanford University, working in an immunology lab, um, doing AIDS research, um, quite ironically now when I look back on my career. Uh, and I did that for about three years and um, decided during that time that I wanted to go back to school and get a PhD. Uh, but I didn't, I knew at that point I didn't want to get a PhD in the biomedical field. Um, I was really interested in environmental, you know, environment and ecology. I grew up on the ocean and the beach and just sort of had that outlook, but I had never taken an ecology or marine biology class ever. So I ended up doing a non thesis driven master's at Stanford University in biological sciences and spent six months down at the Hopkins Marine Station um, and just that pretty much sealed it for me. Um, applied to uh, graduate school and at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography where Kay also went. I didn't get in and uh, I was devastated. I, I realized, you know, after about a month that I had not gotten in. So I started emailing everybody in the department and I just was asking if there's anything I can do. So fortunately, one person wrote back and said, I wasn't able to find a student on this round of applications. Why don't you come down and chat with me? Um, and so I went down and sort of interviewed with him and he agreed to let me in to grad school. So I got into, I got into scripts and, you know, uh, ended up studying. I started working on, I always worked on phytoplankton. So these unicellular eukaryotic, uh, microbes in the ocean and started working on dinoflagellates, but then, 
my advisor lost funding in my third year of grad school, so I had to switch projects. So I switched to another phytoplankton group, the diatoms, which is what Kay just mentioned. Um, and a fun fact is that my first PhD defense that I ever sought was actually Kay's PhD defense. Oh, nice. So yeah. um, it was my first year as a first year graduate student. And, you know, the first years all get together and go to all the PhD <laughs> defenses. And his was the first one. How did he do? He did great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, uh, I started working on diatoms and studying transport proteins called silicon transporters. So diatoms make their cell walls out of silicon dioxide, which is glass. So they're often called the glass houses of the sea. And I was really interested in the membrane transporters and how they took up silicon. So I think I got my, I know I got my degree in marine biology from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, having never cultured algae, having never gone to sea, um, <laughs> and having a largely molecular and biochemical PhD thesis. But that was my sort of my outlook and my, what I was comfortable with. And so I was, you know, grad school, I spent sort of looking at how diatoms build their cell walls. And just about as I was graduating, um, Kay had actually become faculty at Rutgers, and I wanted to stay working on molecular biology in diatoms, and there were only three people, one of them being my advisor, uh, but three people in the country doing that, so um, Kay being one of them. So I actually came and did a postdoc with Kay. Uh, I studied how diatoms build their cell walls in grad school, and I wanted to study how diatoms break down their cell walls as a postdoc. So I came and started studying diatoms with Kay, looking at programmed cell death mechanisms and how these organisms die. And then I ended up staying on, was um, uh, promoted to the research faculty here. Um, and it actually wasn't during my postdoc with Kay that I started studying viruses. I probably am the most recent addition to the world of virology. Um, I only started studying viruses about five years ago. And unlike Brad, I approached it from the host side. I was really interested in how viruses kill diatoms, how that leads to regeneration of silicon and silicon cycling and how that interfaces with carbon cycling. And so um, I just started, I sort of feel a little bit like an imposter up here because I don't consider myself a virologist. Um, I really do approach it from the host point of view and I'm starting, I'm learning and you know, learning about viruses and sort of the unique aspects of viruses. And I think it's fascinating and it's one of the great things about our job as academics is constantly being able to challenge yourself to learn new things, so. For sure. Yeah. Siobhan, where are you from? I am from New Jersey. Wow. Um, I, I did get out for a few years, but yes. Where, where, what part of New Jersey? I'm from South Orange, New Jersey, right near Seton Hall. And my dad went to Seton Hall. My grandfather went to Seton Hall. I grew up one block away. I did not go to Seton Hall. <laughs> uh, and my science career started on the campus of the Roche <laughs> of inst uh, company. I didn't know that. Uh, back in, up until the mid-1990s, they had an internship program where local high school students could come and work there 20 hours a week. And I was very interested in not going to high school 100% of the day. And uh, my, I, I feel like I'm a bit of a synthesis of a lot of the people on this panel. My mother's an immigrant, so I had a lot of, you can't have a job, your job is to be a student. But a, a high school internship program, then I could earn six, you know, fifty an hour. So I worked at um, macromolecular engineering in the physical chemistry division at uh, Roche, which basically meant we produced uh, vectors for protein overproduction. And once we perfected them, they got handed over to someone else and they do the structural work on them. I learned a lot that uh, summer. I had a great mentor. You know, people say that uh, people going to industry didn't enjoy teaching. He was a fantastic teacher, a guy by the name of Dave Waugh, who left just before his pension vested for a position at the NIH because <laughs> Roche was going to eventually leave New Jersey. They just weren't announcing it. And every two weeks they were firing somebody in our group. It was terribly demoralizing. And so I learned from an early age, I was not headed to industry. Uh, based on uh, my experience there, I came to my flagship state university to get a degree in molecular biology and biochemistry. I cast about for things other than molecular biology to do to make sure I didn't accidentally become a scientist because of how I were, was set up in a lab when I was 16 years old. I ended up in the food science department where I had fantastic mentors there, uh, Don Schaffner for predictive food microbiology. I became a mathematical modeler. And then just to make sure that this whole 
uh, microbes and math thing was really for me. I did my senior thesis with Rick Ludisher on food physical chemistry. And I have confirmed I am, do not want to be a chemist. <laughs> so I leaned into the bio part of biochemistry after that. I uh, went to Germany for a while and I worked on listeria phages there. My first experience working with uh, phages with Martin Lissner, who's now in Switzerland. And then I came back to the U.S. to do a Ph.D. eventually in phage biology with Paul Turner at Yale. And that's how I got into experimental evolution. I worked with Eddie Holmes after that um, when he was at Penn State. He's now at University of Sydney uh, learning bioinformatics and understanding the deeper phylogenetics of viruses. And miraculously, a position opened up at my home university and uh, they hired me. And here you are. Yeah. We just had Paul Turner on Twivo. I think we mentioned you. Maybe I don't think hear, so. Not but the recording, <laughs> maybe before or afterwards. He's had a number of illustrious uh, students this week. I was his first PhD student, though. Uh -huh. so. yes. It's always good to be the first. I was Peter Palacy's first. I enjoyed it. Okay, so there you go. I, I love hearing stories because most of the time in science, they're not directed, right? They're kind of wandering, just like science is itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love That's it. Good point. You don't have to plan it out. I tell people, don't worry about it. It'll, if you just be curious, it'll work. So let's uh, talk a little bit about your science. Now, um, Brad, Brad wrote us an email <laughs> last December, and he says, "I cringe when you talk about plant viruses on Twitter." I didn't say it exactly <laughs> that way. <laughs> it's okay. You sometimes cringe, but that's fine because we, we're not. All, none of us are plant virologists. We have offered to have a plant virologist on regularly, but she's only been on once, Ann Simon. Yeah. And, and Ann is terrific, uh, but she's, she's not a plant virologist in the sense of, yeah. of real, uh, I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, Ann is terrific. She is a terrific virologist. She cringes when you uh, say that. <laughs> she, well, I, I've known Ann forever because she worked on the uh, same type of virus I did uh, as a postdoc when I was a grad student. So I've known her since her California days. Um, at, working on turnip crinkle, which which she she did, but but what I mean by that is um, the the uh, so so sh she works on a model system right. uh, primarily, and so she knows that terrifically well, and is a wonderful molecular virologist. Um, but uh, people uh, uh, like I, th I think of a guy like Bryce Falk. Uh, who you probably don't know, do. uh, who's, yeah, yeah. who's at UC Davis, yeah. uh, who has just worked on a ton of, of terrific uh, plant virus systems mm -hmm. and experimental systems. So, so going from the greenhouse, going to the field, and, and going to the lab and, and doing the uh, molecular stuff with, with infectious sure. clones and taking back and forth, vector virus interactions, all that stuff. So, so I guess that's the kind of person I think of when I think of people who really have depth. I, I think she would agree that yeah. she's interested in understanding how vi the virus replicates and just happens to use a plant virus as a model. But is less concerned with the host and effects on the host as maybe Bryce and others would be. She she got into it for, for some of the same, I mean, she got into that virus to turn up crinkle for some of the reasons that I sort of stayed in tomato bushy stunt as a, a closely related viruses at the time because she was uh, interested in the satellite RNAs of them as a postdoc, uh, and it turned out to be a satellite defective RNA hybrid uh, that she first characterized when she was at uh, uh, in San Diego, actually. Um, and so then she continued with that system because it turned out to be a terrific experimental system to mm -hmm. to open up. And we were doing sort of parallel work in in. Uh, Tomato bushy stunt, which again is a related virus, but we were working on defective RNAs of them. Well, I, I understand that you cringe because we're not, especially when Dixon talks about plants, right? We're not plant biologists, we make mistakes. But actually, there's someone here who often corrects us. Steen is yeah. here and he writes in when we get things wrong, and, right? And well, he should. Thank you very much. <laughs> we haven't written in lately. I guess we haven't done any plant papers, right? Yeah. Okay. We, well, well, today you could write in and say, "Tell us if any of them." Just right, cringe. Yeah, <laughs> the, the stuff, the stuff that um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm not on the 
podcast so I don't have to show my ignorance of animal systems. Uh, but every, <laughs> every, time, here for. <laughs> every time I teach something like herpes or something like that or, or uh, you know, viruses uh, that, that uh, infect you know, nerve cells or things like that, I have to go and figure out what all these things are well, because... We're also specialized that yeah. we always have to go and, out of our comfort. And so right? I, I took all these plant courses, you know, as an undergraduate. I had to slog through, you know, plant anatomy and taxonomy and all these things that I hated because they were so descriptive. But, you know, at the en in the end, you, you get that all the difference between the, the different uh, organs, the different tissues, et cetera, et cetera, and how they react to things. And so, so a lot of us labor under the impression <laughs> that a lot of plant viruses are transmitted by vectors. A lot of them are. Could you say what the proportion is? About 80%. 80%. The, the number that I So you have an intermediate is. host to deal with. Does the virus yeah. actually replicate in the vector? Sometimes, or is it sometimes just not. Paratenic, it just sometimes and mechanically? Sometimes not. There, are, there are all kinds of, you, you name it, write books about it. But uh, so, so some, like the, the rayoviruses that we work on some, they, they go through, they replicate in almost every insect um, cell type. Uh, so they have to go through and they have to replicate in everything, and, and in, including the, the brain, uh, salivary glands, accessory salivary glands, et cetera, et cetera, and get out. Uh, but others get sucked up and they essentially uh, bind very transiently uh, to the stylet and they then get spit, spit back out again. So the ones that are transmitted by vectors that actually allow replication of the virus inside the vector, and then it infects the plant as well, those are like worlds apart in terms of biology. They, they are, and, and in fact, the, when, when I got into uh, Don Ness's lab, I, I ended up working on the fungal system, that he, the chestnut blight uh, fungal system that he was just starting to work on. But the other uh, virus that I was actually more interested in working on at, at the time that he had just hired somebody for was a rayovirus, a, a, a plant, the only, at the time, the only dicot, dicotyledonous plant infecting rayovirus. And what he was working on was sort of exactly that. It's a 12-segmented virus. And so when, when the virus is transmissible, it must be able to replicate in the insect and must be able to replicate in the plant. So in nature, it has to have 12 segments. But if you decide you're just going to be a plant virus and you're going to be happy, it's wound tumor virus is the name of it, you're going to be happy just living in tumors and plants and, and being transmitted from uh, plant to plant through grafts or, or things like that, you start to throw away the segments, essentially, that you don't, that you need for uh, replication in insects, but don't need for uh, replication in plants. And so you, you kind of throw away a couple of segments. The guy who started that work was a, a guy named Lindsey Black, uh, who's a, a wonderful virologist, and he turned his entire collection over to Don Ness to, to do that work. And so, so Don worked toward really trying to figure out what it took to be a, a plant uh, replicating virus versus a uh, leaf hopper, that's the vector infecting virus, and what these extra segments were doing and whether you could take them out and put them back. And unfortunately, this was when he started this was in the 19, early 1980s, late 1970s and 1980s. And so for those of us who are virologists, we know that the double-stranded RNA viruses, the, the rayoviruses, were the last ones to have infectious clones made. It was a real challenge to, to make those. And so we didn't have the molecular tools really to address the question. So it was, it, it was really slogging through. It's a similar problem, mosquitoes and mammals, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a big jump, and people are really interested in that too. That's right. Similar but different. They're both animals. I mean, they're both they're they're both wallless. <laughs> so they're both wallless cells. The the other thing that I'm um, curious about because I don't know anything about that subject, but I, I know our listeners would be, is how does a virus get inside of a fungus? 
The, the short answer is it meets another fungus. So you have fungus A that's infected, fungus B that's not, they get together, uh, that's they, not good they fuse. That, no, no, that's how it works. That, that is Start how it works. Sounds like, a, a fungus. sounds like a dating service. That, 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 that is how it works, and they have a whole system, this vegetative incompatibility system to keep each other at bay, to keep their viruses separate from each other. But the, the sort of... Uh, deeper question in a sense that, that we're really just in the process of answering is, are there other mechanisms that, that work in nature a lot? And I think the answer is yes, and we're just starting to understand some of them. We're just starting to understand that there actually are insects that can transmit a virus from one fungus to another. There are nematodes that can transmit one, a, a virus from one fungus to another. But it, again, that, that's it's a, it's a really nice open area right now. So st up till now, our understanding of fungal viruses is that they remain intracellular. That's right. Do, and, and some of them form capsids, but they just don't leave, right? That's, that's right. So some of them, probably half of them, I think, are, are encapsidated, so have a formal uh, protein okay. coat around them so they can do life on the outside and then get, get back into the inside. But a lot of the ones that we work with and the one that Don was working with and, and that we work with in, in my lab, some we work with both types, uh, are those that uh, simply use vesicles that are host-derived vesicles to encapsidate RNA uh, and with, with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So they don't get out into the world and get vectored back in because they, they just have these host-derived lipid vesicles. So they're not meant for life on the outside. They're just meant to be where they are and, and to do transmission exactly the way that I So can you before. sterilize a fungus from its virus and find out if it can grow by itself or whether oh, yeah. it needs the virus to grow? Yeah, yeah no, you, you can do it a couple of ways. One is uh, you can do it by doing single spore, uh, oh. so, so either sexual spores or asexual spores, whichever you're uh, going for. And so you, you pick through and, and you get a virus-free one. Or you can use the traditional things like ribavirin, uh, other things to, to uh, actually do hyphal tipping, to actually try to kill the virus at, at the tip and then hyphal tip and then, then grow it. Because that's what you need to do, is you need to get an isogenic virus-free line. And what does this mean, hyphal tipping? Line. What is that? It, it means that you're... Uh, a couple of dollars, nice job. <laughs> I haven't tried that. That's a good idea. <laughs> it, it, it means that, that you're looking under a microscope with, with a little uh, scalpel and you're, you're growing a single hyphae out and, and you're chopping off the little tip. And you're hoping it's virus-free. And you're hoping that it's virus-free and then you grow it up and ask, ask that question. Okay. And you, you can treat it with an antiviral as you suggested yeah. to do that. So okay. does it grow better when it's not infected? Yeah. It depend, totally depends on the <laughs> yeah, virus. Yeah, that was my it's, question. It's just like, again, it's just like viruses of, of, of people or of plants or, or anything else. Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes you have a cold and sometimes you have polio. Uh, or, you know, the same, same kind of, or, or sometimes you have uh, influenza. They're totally different kinds of viruses. What types of effects but, will you see on the right. you fungal can see, host? You can see uh, morphological effects. You can see phenotypic effects in the, in the fungus grown in culture. You can see effects on uh, pathology. Uh, so you can uh, put, put one on a plant and a virus-free uh, version of the same thing on the same plant and uh, get uh, infection or not infection or virulence or not virulence. Marilyn Rusnik had a really great paper 10 plus years ago now where they were studying how plants can grow up to those hot springs in Yellowstone. Okay. And it's a virus inside a fungus that's in the roots of the plant. If you don't have the virus in the fungus, then it dies. It's not heat tolerant. I don't want to. Yeah. And to this day, we don't understand the biochemistry behind that. Right. They're, they're, I guess they're still working on it. I never hear from Marilyn on it. She's but retiring. Rusty Marilyn's Rodriguez, retiring soon. Yeah. <laughs> Rusty, Rusty Rodriguez is the person who sort of uh, w was associated with that work with her, and he, I've never seen anything else about it, really. I mean, as an animal virologist, I want to know what viruses do that in us, what viruses make us do certain things we don't know. I mean, you talked about mild versus serious disease. But what virus helps you, the immune system of your gut develop? We know in mice, noroviruses do that. But what about in people? Very hard to do, but really interesting. Cytomegalovirus, right? That's the one that they think is helping our immune system? 
Well, yes, yeah. because it's constantly replicating and stimulating interferon maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But in mice, if you take away neurovirus, if you take away the microbiome of a mouse, the gut is malformed and you can restore it by a neurovirus infection. Wow. So we need some human volunteers <laughs> for that kind of study. How many people are going to volunteer for neurovirus? <laughs> Don't be looking at a lot. All you have to do is take a cruise oh, on a ship. <laughs> it's a three-day three illness. It's come and gone. You can do it we over the weekend. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us, a great example of this is the chestnut blight fungus. Its virulence is attenuated by a virus. And this is a story Don Nuss would never tell us. So perhaps you can tell us. So, so yeah, the the sort of shortish version of that is uh, what, what you said. Uh, the uh, tree is infected by a fungus. So the, so the fungus came from probably from Japan, probably to New Jersey, probably in the, the late 1880s, as far as we can figure out. Yeah, uh, Japanese chestnut was, was uh, brought here a lot uh, as, as a rootstock especially. And so that's probably where it came in. It was first found at the Bronx Zoo in, in 1904, and so that's, that, that, but by that time, it was already epidemic. Uh, so um, the virus story is the, these strains that looked odd were identified in 1951 by one of your Italian brethren, uh, a guy named Baraji, uh, who uh, uh, identified these, these strains from, from healing trees mm -hmm that look different. So these strains were white. We still have some of these white isolates in our lab. They're, they're white, they're a little bit uh, slower growing, and the tree was fighting off the fungus. Mm -hmm. And so they started to look at it. A guy named Jean Grant uh, in, in France really did some of the early seminal work on, on them on, on transmission to show that you could take these six strains of the fungus and put them together with healthy strains. So the six strains we're not killing the tree. The, the healthy, uninfected strains of the fungus were killing the tree. And if you put them together, then the thing that was causing this so-called hypovirulence, this so-called reduced virulence, was transmissible from these white six strains to the uh, previously uninfected strains. And that then if you put that on a tree, it wouldn't kill a tree. And similarly, if you took a tree that was infected with a virulent form of the fungus, a virus-free form of the fungus, killing the tree, and you came along and slapped on this fungus that had virus in it, if you did it right, then it would cure the tree. It would, it would cause the, the fungus to stop growing as fast, allow the tree to fight it off. Yay. Um, so so a, a biological control uh, for the fungus. And so this fungus that had come to North America, so that, that was work in Europe initially. The, in North America, the epidemic had already gone through here. So from, from 1904 to 1950-ish, it went from our part of the country here all the way down to, to where you were brought up in New Orleans, uh, where there are chinkapins. Uh, that were being killed down there. So it went through the entire uh, American chestnut range down to all the chinkapin ranges uh, to, to kill those as well. So that ship had kind of sailed as far as uh, that, uh, as far as doing biological control real time. Um, but so we, we got interested, Don's lab got interested in looking at the virology. He was the first real virologist to, to get into this uh, project. And so he, he got into the virology of it and he picked the one virus that was very effective in Europe at, uh, doing, at causing this so-called hypovirulence. And it turned out to be a really good one to work on, a, 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 very, um, a very robust system. And so he was able to take it out. And, and so I did work on this uh, when I was with him uh, and, and some other things as well. But the postdoc after me was able to uh, essentially uh, take the virus out, which is about a 12.7 kilobase piece of RNA, make an infectious clone, and first use the infectious clone essentially the way you did polio at first, which was to put it back in as DNA and simply launch it as DNA uh, in, in the fungus. But then 
make RNA transcript, use the other approach of making RNA transcripts and, and right. using those as infectious transcripts. And so that, that's what he spent most of the rest of his, of Don's uh, career on was, was essentially um, looking at that, that virus at, at a molecular level like that. And in the end, do, do we understand how the virus attenuates the virulence of the fungus? We understand a fair, we, we understand a lot of the factors that are involved with it. Um, and, um, can you give us a clue? Uh, so, <laughs> so, well, so, um, so, uh, um, that, uh, it, it, uh, causes, uh, slower growth of, of the, Fungus. It, it interferes with a lot of the uh, pathways, um, the the um, uh, uh, G protein mediated signaling pathways are are messed up. Um, and there and there's specific viral proteins that do this. There are specific viral. How proteins many total that viral proteins are encoded? That's a that's a very good question, um, because the, the um, so the the five prime uh, terminal third or so of, of the virus is really well characterized. And there, there are a couple of proteases uh, involved there. And the, the uh, suppressor of RNA silencing is down there. Um, so a lot is known about that. Once you get about a third of the way down the genome, the processing of, of the terminal, really two thirds or so of, of the uh, genomic the polyprotein that is made uh, from that uh, part of the genome. I think Don was never able to, to really figure out mm -hmm. how that processing went uh, because it, it, was, it was not published. Do you continue and this work at all in your lab? We don't continue that part of it. We're, we're actually working on other, other systems. We're, we're working on the, some, of the, um, some of the silencing uh, the, the suppressor of silencing uh, systems, and in fact, that's that's what uh, the two uh, students here, Katie and, and George, are both working on. Um, but the the silencing suppressors of related viruses that I won't go into, um, and their effects on other viruses during co-infections. So that's that's a real interest now. I have to say, I'm very impressed that you remembered that we put DNA into cells of polio first. Nobody remembers. I, you remember that? I, I, I remember it. <laughs> Al Alana probably does because when I teach it, I'm not going to say this in a mean way. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I teach it, I say, Vincent got really lucky because he, okay. he, put, he put DNA in, 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 a, way, in, in a way that, that uh, wouldn't work for a lot of yeah. things in, in a lot of systems, and it, and it worked for this. So, so yeah, it was I, I mean, uh, the reason I mention it, well, there are two things. First, if people don't appreciate the history of sciences. I think there's a lot back there in the literature that's worth reading that you can learn a lot from. And I notice people don't read a lot these days. You know, I'm not accusing anyone, but <laughs> so I'm, I mean, I still go back to the old literature, and it's amazing. The papers are so simple and straightforward. And the techniques are pretty easy. And, you know, I think today our techniques are so good, we're, tar we're starting to drill down a little bit too closely and not seeing the big picture. That's one thing. And the other thing is, when I had cloned this DNA of polio, I said to David both all right, let's put a promoter in front. And he said, ah, to hell with the promoter, just put it in cells. And that showed me just try the simplest thing first, right? Right. We'll put a fancy promoter in, and it worked when we just threw the plasma in because there was probably some cryptic. And that's another lesson. Just try the simplest experiment. Tell what? him Louis Pasteur's famous saying. Chance favors the prepared mind. Luck favors the prepared mind. Luck. Is that right, Steen? Is that what he said? Luck? Maybe you can look <laughs> it up. <laughs> Real <laughs> time. <laughs> I, I, I think that's right, yeah. I think that's right. Well, in French, it's a bit different. Chance? chance favors the perfect train line. In French, it's, it's chance, which is luck. Luck. Okay. Oh. Aha. 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 Okay. So same. Oh, in terms of reading the literature, I think there, there's a entire new generation of virologists that 100% agree with this. They're called phage biologists. <laughs> you know, the 1980s was a huge disconnect. Yeah. It, we lost our, our, our forefathers. Right. 
uh, retrained and went into other kinds of virology True. or other aspects yeah, of molecular yeah. biology. And so people coming up don't necessarily come up in true phage labs. And uh, there are a whole bunch of, of threads of that weren't fully explored in the old literature that because of funding just never got explored and you can just pick them up and keep going. Yes, absolutely right. Yeah. At ASV this year, the last talk was by Bill Summers, who you must know, right? I Yeah, I knew him from Yale, yeah. And he talked about how virology all emerged from phages throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s. That's all that we never, it informed everything. I'm not sure whether some TMV people might have independently. <laughs> yeah, but the phage yeah. people did the genetics, right? The TMV yeah. less so. They more did the biochemical and yeah. chemical aspects, right? But the genetics really came from the phage. And we've forgotten all that, unfortunately. I, I didn't go into it, but my first PI from uh, Roche, he lent me a book called Phage and the Origins of Molecular yeah. Biology, a Feshrift to Max Delbruck. And that was the reason I became a biologist. It's a great book. It's on my shelf. It's all shredded. Every page is... They reprinted it in the 90s. They made a second edition. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. So since we have your attention, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> let's talk about some of your work. You, I want to talk, th this paper you published, which has a great title, Why Are RNA Virus Mutations Rates So Damn High? Did they give you shit about damn no, in the title? No, no. And actually, we looked up worse words, and you can find them in other titles. So I was able to convince my lab that it was okay to go with, with that one. That paper came out of uh, you know the benefits of peer review. I reviewed Adam Loring's paper on um, trying to tease apart whether or not uh, speed of replication, purely speed of replication, is what's driving part of the high mutation rate of RNA virus RDRPs, or is it something more about the polymerase, uh, the polymerase error of that level is beneficial in some way to RNA viruses. And they have a, a wonderful paper in polio where they've teased that apart right, in, in right. the system. I was a peer reviewer on that paper. And then mm. the journal came back to me and said, do you want to write an intro to right. it? You know, <laughs> more approachable intro. And uh, this was last summer. And I tried to think of other ways to frame the the study, I really did. <laughs> but those of you who were in the lab last summer, this is the only way we can think of, of explaining it. So there's a nice figure, which I've pulled out here. With the, you've got uh, viroids, really high mutation rate, right? And then you have uh, RNA viruses, a little less. And then with those are single-stranded, your guys, DNA viruses. Yes, yes. I, I, I straddle the line. I, I do have RNA virus interest too. <laughs> And then there's some, these are DNA phages, right? Double-stranded DNA viruses, Double herpes viruses in there too. And then uh, bacteria and uh, mammals are the lowest. So um, I, I guess I have two questions. First of all, why are RNA virus mutation rates so damn high? Faster is better, apparently. It's faster? Uh, yes. So, so they, they did find evidence uh, in Adam Loring's polio fast. system for uh, replication speed being the driver of a, you know, a s small amount of the mutation rate being higher. It's not optimized that RNA viruses live at the mutation rates they'd like. They're forced to live there because they want to get out of cells fast. Okay. But it's also not having error correction, right? Yes. But of course, you've got the um, coronaviruses that do have some right. ability to have so, error correction. So to make a really big RNA genome, you need to have some error. Did yes. you see, by the way, the biggest corona nidovirus genome that they found in planaria and um, Eric Kandel's mollusk. What is it called? Aplesia. Aplesia. 40 KB. And Alex Gorbelenia says now there's no upper limit to RNA genomes, theoretically. Does it have the same, is its XON much better than yeah, the one that SARS and MERS have? I mean, these are only sequences, right? So yeah. We don't know. That's really so. The the cool thing about the speed issue is that for these little these picorna RNA polymerases, you can mess up their recombination by slowing them down. I was going to ask about that. So there are mutations in the polymerases that cut down the, the recombination rate, and it does it does it simply by slowing down the polymerase. Does it actually change the mutation rate as well then, or it's uh -huh. does because we have. Good. They are separate uh, mutations, parts of separate amino acids on the polymerase, but there is some interplay uh, between mutation rate and, and recombination. I think you can you can be complementing one with the other. I believe so. It's pretty neat that it's about speed in the end. So, what about these single-stranded DNA viruses? Why do you have them with 
RNA virus. Why are they there? That's the truth is that they have a high mutation rate. And that's something you're interested in, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we figured out all of the ways that single-stranded DNA viruses manage to mimic the mutation rates that RDRPs can mm -hmm. uh, give. We don't have firm evidence that the mutation rate truly becomes as high as animal infecting RNA viruses, but they're absolutely higher than they should be because right. these viruses replicate with the polymerases of their host cells. In bacteriophages, we know for a fact which polymerases do the replication. They're processive. They have very high, muta uh, very low mutation rates. They have high fidelity, but yet the viruses have two orders of magnitude higher mutation rates than mm -hmm. the polymerases with which they replicate. One of the uh, sources of mutation that these viruses have come to rely on is uh, oxidative damage is the short version of it. Um, we, we also know from work with phages, they ap actively avoid DNA repair. So FIX174 is about 5,000 bases long. It should have five motifs for methyl-directed uh, mismatch repair. If you look on GenBank, half of the isolates have zero of those motifs and half have one. Mm -hmm. And there's a group in Spain that engineered in the GATC motifs and they can lower the mutation rate of FIX174. Huh. So... They, uh, they cool. actively avoid DNA mm -hmm. repair. We don't know if they do something to mess up the polymerases error correction that hasn't been rigorously studied, but one of the things that's affecting them is a, a strand-specific C to T overrepresentation of the in mutation rate. They Cytosines deaminate and they're not repaired. And do you think this is also a matter of being fast? <sighs> like the RNA viruses um, or it's something different? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Um, Fix one seventy four is thought to be the fastest replicating virus on the planet, so your datum there says that they love doing things very fast, yeah. fast but they, they can get out in ten minutes. <laughs> and their big genome is held at 5, it's it's five thousand three hundred and eighty six bases. They can get out of a cell in ten minutes. Yes, that's <laughs> it. Takes it's actually slower in our lab, but that's the fastest and recorded in the old literature. Lord. Wow, that's the faster amazing. I type, the more mistakes I make. <laughs> uh, but again, there the polymerase can't be optimized for the virus's needs. It's still the host's process it's host, polymerase. Right. So it's got to be something else. Yeah. Right. And it's hard to talk about replication speed in eukaryotic viruses in whole eukaryotes. Uh, plant viruses, it's really hard to talk about. So uh, much of the work we do on SSDNA viruses is in plants, and I wouldn't say that SSDNA viruses of plants are particularly fast relative to RNA viruses of plants mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something like that. But you can say that about phages. SSDNA, um, 574 and its relatives are faster than SSRNA phages. So they must encode proteins that are doing this, are making errors in some way, right? Like uh, avoiding repair, you said, right? Well, they're avoiding repair by by selection, have taking them away from having just the, the tetranucleotide repeat that E. coli okay. would represent. So there's, there's okay. no protein specific. Right, so the genome has evolved to not have those signals, right? But do we? Do you think that some proteins are involved in well as well in some way, or none are known to? Uh, it would make sense if uh, some of these SSDNA viruses messed up the proofreading subunits mm -hmm. of these uh, polymerases they're uh, replicating with. But no one's ever observed those interactions. There's a lot of work done in vitro on FIX174 replication. That was the system for showing DNA replication in a test tube, and hmm. the mutation rates are similar in vitro test tube and in vivo. So, right. it's so you, you published this paper this year, Circular Rep Encoding Single-Stranded DNA Viruses, which is what we're talking about. You call them CRESS yes. for short. It says that they were once thought to be rare for viruses, but now we realize they're more. So can you address that a little bit? Well, I still, when I give talks, say, who here in this room has heard of single-stranded DNA viruses? And I gave a talk at Fox Chase Cancer Center last year, and only the guy who invited me had ever heard of them. And I was like, great, this will be a learning experience for us all. <laughs> uh, they're not part of the, the introduction to viruses that most biologists get. Mm -hmm. um, 5 and 74 was a great model system, but in the economically important uh, you know, crop and animal production world and in human disease, SSDNA viruses, and specifically circular uh, single-stranded DNA viruses, mm -hmm. weren't particularly noticeable. We don't have a single circular single-stranded DNA virus we consider to be a pathogen of a human right now. We have one. We know that they're in our 
about up to 100 percent of blood donors have them in yes. their blood, but we don't necessarily know what they're doing. Right. The ones that were affecting agriculture, I, uh, the dean of our college discovered that. Uh, I introduced them okay. earlier. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the very first DNA uh, virus of plants was discovered to be DNA by Bob Goodman. And mm -hmm. uh, that was only in 79, 78. So it's only been 40 years we knew these things were there. And while single crest DNA viruses are big problems in uh, crop produ production, especially throughout the developing world, mm -hmm. there hasn't been as much of a giant m push to understand their biology and research. And people thought they were evolving it was a plant problem. It wasn't something that humans cared about too much. In the mid-90s, we started to affect uh, hog production. Porcine circovirus 2 right. is associated with post-weaning maturation wasting syndrome, which now all hog production just vaccinates against uh, PCV2. Uh, I think in general, they were, it was seen as fluke viruses that were containable. Weird novel genome structure, not particularly there. This was backed up by the, the first people who were doing metagenomics, people looking in the oceans and uh, thinking they were having unbiased methods to truly observe the mm -hmm. DNA macromolecules around. Turns out it was biased towards double-stranded DNA. And then when they discovered this, uh, in part because we, had, we found an enzyme with a superpower of amplifying circular single-stranded DNA more than everything else, we realized that you can f find these things everywhere in Antarctica, in mm -hmm. deserts, in ice, everywhere. Yeah, we have no idea what they're infecting for the most part, this right? This is the problem with all the, the DNA sequencing yes. era that we're getting things divorced from ecology, yeah. But you can find these in many different environments and we don't know if they all have the high error rates as the well-characterized viruses, right? We're not finding super long ones. So uh, viral genomes are constrained by mutation rate, we think. Uh, Apparently, our upper end on Nidovirales keeps going up. Uh, the biggest single-stranded DNA virus that's been found was in Archaea, and it was about 25 kb. And we found nothing that big in eubacteria or eukaryotes. Um, they, mm. The single molecules themselves are sticking under 10 kb. And if they need more than that, then they split things up into segments, typically. Right, right. So these porcine circoviruses, they're the ones that contaminated the rotavirus vaccines a number of years ago, right? Yeah, From yeah. the trips in used to make the cell culture? That was PCV1, I think. Yeah. Yeah, which is not considered a giant pathogen. Yeah, and so for a while, the rotavirus vaccines were withdrawn until we decided that these viruses were of no consequence to humans. So we all have them in our blood, right? Everybody in this room. I don't much. know whether everyone in this room... I, well, first of all, many of us are not vaccinated against rotavirus if we're old. But even um, if you're not, you still, you still have it's, these It's viruses. the anelloviruses they, they yeah. find most prevalently in people's blood, and we really don't understand those. But they're circular, single-stranded DNA. Yes, but right? they don't contain a replication-associated protein, right. and so we don't understand their biology. We, we understand it even less than we do ah, than the other. So they're, they're not rep encoding. They're not rep encoding. What do they encode? Uh, I don't check in on the anelloviruses frequently, <laughs> but we didn't understand any of the functions of their proteins the last time I did. I follow them because I'm racking yellow, you know. Well, that fell flat. <laughs> Who has anelloviruses in their bloodstream? Oh, you all have to raise your hand. You all do. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's talk. Let's talk about Wait, some. I have one other question. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so. I heard you give a great talk here a couple months ago um, where you were talking about those crest viruses. Um, and it was really great because you were using a lot of molecular biology information, but also some sort of more computational approaches. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And I have a student who likes similar things. And my question is, how would I tell someone to train for that? <laughs> what types of training? If someone wanted to become you, <laughs> what types of training? Um, or what types of classes should they you take? Your bio? <laughs> I, I, I've been very surprised that most of the people who work with me want to do both sides of right. things. And uh, so it, it's, I think we, at least some of us envisioned there would be a model, there'd be pure bioinformaticians collaborating with people who were more steeped in the organismal details, but people want to have both and probably that's being valued on the job market. I, I don't know. Uh, I did that by hopscotching, working in a molecular environment and then working in a computational environment. And I kept repeating that. So I, I think it's, it's fine to 
go where you're getting great training and learning stuff, even if it's not in the system that you eventually want to, you think is most interesting. And I hear a lot of, of uh, heads nodding, so. <laughs> you know R? No, I'm terrible. R, R, well, I was a graduate student. R was just coming in when I was finishing. Okay, you're, you're, you're feeling me on this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I learned SAS. And right uh, like when I did my research here as an undergraduate, we did everything in SAS. Yeah, I remember SAS. And it's one of those projects for sabbatical future yeah. is that I have to get as up to date as my lab mm -hmm. on R. Okay. The last two summers I've tried to teach myself R. And that's still, yeah, I'm, maybe next summer it'll work out. Some of my postdocs run workshops in R. I know. Yeah. Would you like to get piped I'm into on, that? I'm on the list for this. I would, I would like to get piped into that. <laughs> this yeah. is something that gets advertised around the department. Yeah. And some branches of the American Society for Microbiology have held our workshops yeah. as part of their activities. And so this is something that's been on my agenda for TSS for... Does anybody here know what you mean by that? Because <laughs> I was I waiting, to know I was waiting for that. you to say that. Dick. Say it again? I was waiting for you. Well, I just said it. So tell me what you mean <laughs> specifically by what you're saying. In terms of workshops? Yeah, yeah. What are you going to learn at that workshop? Uh, well, so they... <laughs> yeah. okay, what is R? R is an open source uh, statistical uh, oh. programming language and analysis framework oh. that was called R because it's not S. Because S costs money. So this is R. And, well, uh, named by a geneticist, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> not a Drosophila and geneticist. It's, <laughs> right. it's incredibly R. fully functional. Uh, fully featured now compared okay. to okay. when I was in graduate school and it was, you know, you would be often building a lot of your own tools yourself. This is something where people are releasing packages to help you make much more beautiful images than you can make. Would you like to learn R, Dixon? Now that I know what it is, yes, of right. course. <laughs> we, we, can, we can get you into a summer course. No, we had, we had a department of biostatistics in our School of Public Health and I collaborated with them extensively because I was... Uh, some part of my brain didn't absorb that uh, knowledge as I was growing up. And it worked out beautifully because I got to meet a lot of new friends. I never published many papers with just a single authorship. And I had a great relationship with them because it could suggest new experiments based on the results that I'd already obtained. So I ended up describing the growth curve for trichinella, which no one else had ever done before. It was like looking at a bacterial growth curve and saying, oh, you know what that is. And I was... You know, how come I'm the first person to ever do that? And I know why, too, because nobody else had access to the biostatisticians to tell them, that, oh, no, you need to go back and get more samples, and you need to measure this differently, and that's, and you got a lot of good coaching from these people. So it sounds like you can do it yourself now. It's just by going online and... There's no substitute for someone who actually deeply cares about There's data none. analysis. There's, no, that's true. That is absolutely true. That's the truth. So can it's we, called R. Can we move into the oceans now? Absolutely. Yes. So, so I know you're waiting. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just like excited. <laughs> <laughs> waiting. Um, Kay, did you say the biomass in the, the oceans turn over every... 10 minutes, is that right? No, 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 every uh, couple of weeks. And then the land is every couple decades. That's decades. right, based okay. on productivity to biomass That's ratios, true. yeah. So this is largely from virus infections? It's not just virus infections. Um, things in the oceans are also eaten. Um, okay. So there's a few different ecosystem pathways that kind of dictate the fate of photosynthetically produced organic matter mm -hmm. and the phytoplankton that both Kim and I had mentioned, um, you know, these are microscopic plants, for lack of a better word, but they're the base of the food webs. Um, they're also that initial interface with atmospheric CO2. Right. Um, so they're really important for CO2 drawdown, and they produce half of the oxygen on the planet, mm -hmm. right? So every other breath that you all take, you can thank a phytoplankton for that. And there are bumper stickers that say, have you thanked your phytoplankton today? I, I don't have one, but <laughs> I've heard they exist. I want to get one. Um, and so, so these are photosynthesizing. Yeah, photosynthesizing. And a lot of the organisms, the organisms that I study and, and Kim studies as well, make minerals. She mentioned silica. One of the ones that I study, they are coccolithophores, right. which are calcium carbonate Great. biomineralizers. Great. Yeah, right? No, they, they rule. You they should rule. have a bumper sticker well, that we, says they rule. Well, we, they, <laughs> they, they, they really rule. <laughs> and, there's, and there are, I argue that they're the rock stars of phytoplankton as well because 
they're really easily seen by Earth observing satellites. Right. And so if you look at, if any of you log on to NASA's webpage, there's a satellite, um, Modus Aqua, that is constantly observing um, Earth. There's also Modus Terra, which is more um, terrestrial based, but but it's always taking pictures. And the one thing you can always see a coccolithophore bloom by its massive uh, turquoise blue waters. And these blooms are hundreds of square uh, k kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're they're massive, and we call that the mesoscale. Um, and so the fate of that stuff and its turnover can be dictated by whether it's eaten, whether they aggregate and into like particles and sink into the deep ocean, which the average is about 4,000 meters. That's the average depth of the ocean. And that's like sequestration of carbon, essentially. Or if they die through these, through viral infection or program cell death, and then that actually will release a lot of dissolved organic matter that uh, marine bacteria and archaea, marine microbes will, will act on. Um, and respond. Mm -hmm. So Emiliana is one of these. It's a coca lithophores yeah. that causes and these the, blooms. Right. The reason blooms, I say right? a rock star, like if you go to the supermarket and you see a tabloid, you know, there's a rock star there. You recognize them. You're like, yes, you know. So if you look at the the satellite images, you're like, e hux, e hux, e hux. <laughs> but it's not only e hux. There are other organisms that do this, right? There are other lots of different coccolithophores. Okay. They're really diverse. Um, Emiliania and a close cousin, Jeffrey Caps, are the two dominant. Okay. So when you get a bloom, Glo and they they bloom globally. Why is what makes the bloom emerge? Uh, what are the conditions that cause it to form? Yeah, so normally it's nutrient delivery into the upper ocean. So mm -hmm. these phytoplankton only bloom in the upper skin, so the sunlit zone of the ocean, right. which we call the euphotic zone. Um, and so I mentioned 4,000 meters average depth. Um, it's the upper 100 meters or so, sometimes less, sometimes more. And so when there's adequate nutrient delivery, adequate sunlight, um, relief from removal processes like infection and grazing, then they can accumulate and mm -hmm. form these blooms. And so what's really interesting for me, the thing that I love about marine virology that, you know, really gets me pumped is, um, is the scales that we have to play across in marine vir virology. So these interactions between viruses and hosts take place in the microscale right? And it requires contact. And that's less than a hundred micron scale. These, but, but yet these infections propagate mm -hmm. across hundreds of square kilometer scale, right? So that's 10 orders of magnitude that this process has to span. And how that actually works um, at, at the, the concentrations, the densities that the hosts are at, which is about a thousand per mil in a bloom, um, how that works over the time frame that blooms are, are, no, are seen by satellites to, to bloom and then bust. Um, and the physics that are involved in that in regulating encounter rates are, we, we've been doing a lot of work on that. And um, basically based on our calculations, and I don't know how much you guys have talked about encounter rates in this particular podcast, but... No. Um, it's dictated by a lot of things. Most, most viruses move around by Brownian motion, right? Um, but hosts can also influence contact by differential settling. And then there's also the ocean is a windy place, right? That's turbulence and dissipation rates. So all of these things factor into encounter rates. Um, and if you do the, the simulations with some of our physics uh, colleagues, a virus will encounter a host once every 10 days but blooms form and crash within about a week. And so one of the things that we're interested in is, is how this uh, infection and propagation and termination actually work. Um, and it looks like some of our latest work is looking at that it doesn't follow classic Lodka Volterra density dependent encounter rates, that the blooms that we see in the ocean across these scales are actually harboring temperate infection mm -hmm. dynamics um, where the viruses are kind of in a detente yeah. and and so basically when you have a proliferation a, a bloom it's a proliferation of infected cells and temperate infection is a really important aspect in the in the ocean because it can confer 
defense against multiple infection. It can give you enhanced capability. Like in bacteriophage world, lysogeny is the classic mm -hmm. integration mm -hmm. into the genome. But Emiliani Huxley has a eukaryotic phytoplankton, and to date we don't have evidence that there's actual integration. So, so, that, so there's something about this interaction. It's almost like a temporary symbiosis in a way, because in some cases, these infected, temporally infected cells can actually, they have enhanced growth rates. Um, and this is a paper that, that we're currently, we submitted it to, to science last week. Um, and so we'll see what happens. But this is a completely new way of how we envision infection propagating in the ocean in this particular system because it's it removes the barrier of physical contact sure. mm -hmm. because yeah. they're already there and then what happens is when the what we found is that when they actually when when the host encounter nutrient limitation so they run out i mentioned nutrient delivery is helps with bloom mm -hmm. propagation um, eventually those nutrients run out and the host encounter and and uh and encompass um physiological stress that's when they trigger to the lytic phase. So do you think and, they're... I'm sorry? Go ahead. No, I was just curious because I was just listening to Bonnie Bassler talk in my head about quorum sensing molecules, and I'm sure you must have thought about this. Do you think there's a density-dependent uh, um, concentration of whatever they're throwing out as waste products that might trigger a lysogenic event? It, it could be, yeah. I mean, uh, infochemicals are, are common, um, in, in the ocean, we've done a, a, a decent amount of work looking at the types of dissolved chemicals that have information, you know, essentially infochemicals that Bonnie discovered with, um, with bioluminescence. Those are acylated homoserine lactones. But, um, but in our cases, it, when, when viruses do infect and they switch to the lytic phase, mm. um, they actually produce a whole unique suite of lipids, which are dissolved. These are glycosphingolipids. Um, which actually induce programmed cell death pathways. We can isolate them. We can def uh, find them dissolved in the in the in the water. What what types of infochemicals and if they actually function in in establishing a temperate infection? We haven't discovered yet, but undoubtedly, I think they probably you know play a role. But why are they any different from a virus spreading through the bloom? A chemical a virus? They're both tiny, they're right? Already inside the organism. No, but virus, so you said before yeah. that the the virus release kinetic dynamics can't explain this bloom. It's yeah. So that's why no, you're invoking yeah. some lysogeny thing. But why would a virus be any different from a small chemical that we're thinking about here? I don't think it is. That's yeah. why a vi being in the ocean, being outside of a host, is a horrible place. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Period. Because you have to find a host to replicate. Right. They're obligate right. parasites. And they're uh -huh. actually, they're, they're susceptible to really intense degradation. So in our system, mm. to mm. complicate the whole encounter rate thing, um, infectivity is important, right? And so in our system in the lab, most of our viruses that are produced, and we grow them at high densities in the lab, much higher, a few orders of magnitude higher than we mm -hmm. grow in the, in the ocean, that we find them in the ocean. And that kind of got us thinking that our laboratory work has actually biased our thoughts about lockable tear and counter rates, lytic yeah, infection, yeah, yeah. and it may not be happening in the ocean. And we started doing work on the physics and it sort of started to piece together. Um, um, but uh, I forget, I've lost my train of thought. Can I, can I jump in then? Yeah. Um, so what kind of genomes are we talking about of these viruses? These are double-stranded. They're among the, uh, the largest viruses on the planet. So they're, they're close relatives of Mimi virus. Oh. They're, they're double phycotiviridae, double-stranded DNA. Viridae, double -stranded DNA. Their genomes are about 500 KB. Okay. They have about 500 genes. Um, and this is an interesting thing about marine virology, and I don't know if others that you've talked to, Curtis Suttle or... Um, who was the other marine virologist you had mentioned? Forrest. Forrest. Yeah, Forrest has a lot of marine genomics, virogenomics. Is that one of the things that double-stranded DNA viruses do, including bacteriophage, is they gobble up DNA. Typically, it's from their hosts, and there's a lot of lateral gene transfer. And so, mm -hmm. um, and, and they actually use what we call auxiliary metabolic genes that they've taken from the host and kind of tweaked to help augment right. the host's right. physiology right. while they're infecting. And our, our viruses are very similar. Those, those glycosphingolipids that I mentioned, the viruses have a near complete pathway, uh, uh. which is derived from the host. 
but they've tweaked it um, because glycosphingolipids are also really important for just general trafficking, organellar trafficking. They're, but there are some really toxic ones that induce programmed cell death in both plants and animals. And so our virus produces one of those types. And so when, when that accumulates in the cell uh, during the lytic mm -hmm. uh, phase, we think that's how a virus counts to a thousand, basically. Um, that's the burst size when they're in lytic. Uh, when they've when they've switched over is because that level of subcellular glycosphingolipid happens to sort of trigger the uh, lysis and release pathway when when the viruses get to about a thousand or so. I really like that you mentioned the scale here. I never really thought of that because we think about how a virus goes from the lung to the brain. Yeah. And you're talking about hundreds of miles. Yeah, and so right? we've been think. <laughs> well, yeah, and so we've been thinking about. When we go out to sea, um, one of the things we've been thinking about more recently, um, and one of my grad students who's here, is looking at ways in which when viruses are switched into the lytic program, what are ways that we can transmit viruses in the ocean? And one way you can do that is through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, one of my former postdocs, Asaf Ardi, who's at the Weizmann Institution, and he has a really productive lab of his own. We were collaborating, and, um, and I, when I was leading an expedition in the North Atlantic, we were interfacing with atmospheric scientists where they were collecting aerosols and atmosphere, um, a atmospheric samples that were, you know, um, generated by wind turbulence, but they were about ship level. And we could detect these viruses in, in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and the aerosols. And, and you could do some really interesting games then, because then I mentioned their... Um, in infectivity is is important and so viruses will lose infectivity when they're exposed to uv light even visible light and in our system that kind of decays in about three days and so that that's another layer onto this contact thing um so if you know the wind speed and you know the time right you can sort of chart out a radius yeah, sure. of potential delivery into other types of, of places in the North Atlantic. So, so that's one. Um, the other is just the incorporation. When these things are incorporated into the atmosphere, what impact they have on atmospheric cloud condensation nuclei and how the, that small thing actually is, could be part of atmospheric <laughs> climate feedback. And, could you tell and us something about cloud formation with regards to the uh, organism you uh, specialize in? Yeah, so Emiliania huxleyi, um, it produces a gas, dimethyl sulfide, which is a sulfur gas. It's volatile. It's the smell of the ocean. So when you guys go to the ocean and you say, oh, that smells, I smell the ocean, you're smelling <laughs> DMS. It's not the only organism that produces DMS. Dinoflagellates produce it and a bunch of others. Um, infection tends to stimulate production of, of DMS. Uh, grazing processes also do that a little bit. Um, and so that's an, that's an interesting part because that's what what we call secondary. I'm learning a lot about aerosols. Um, and Ben is back there. He's the grad student who's been, whose PhD is, is on this. <laughs> but these are secondary aerosols. These are, so DMS will diffuse out of the atmosphere, out of the ocean. And then there are in situ atmospheric processes that will form aerosols and then clouds. Um, but viruses can also get entrained in aerosols through bubbles mm -hmm. um, that are formed. And those are primary aerosols. And so we are sort of looking at, and this has not really been looked at before, is how viral composition, um, whether it's an enveloped virus, our viruses are enveloped, they, they have lipid membranes around them. There's some evidence that enveloped viruses get more entrained into atmospheric aerosols, um, preferentially over those that aren't enveloped. And then what that organic matter composition does to cloud properties and the formation of warm water clouds and ice clouds and how they can form this nuclei. Do you think there are cells up there that are getting infected uh, also? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I don't know about infected. There are a lot of viruses <laughs> up there. I mean, Curtis Suttle was part of a study that recently, yeah. this past year, I think. Yeah, he showed that the, the sea is whipped up and the viruses go high and then they rain down over Spain. For ex he put, That's right. He and put, then they're deposited yes. in, in maybe glaciers and things like yeah. that. So, so someone said maybe they're infecting something up there. And I, I'm not aware of any cellular organisms. <laughs> up, are you? Do you know if any... 
There are some. Donna yeah. Fennell, we have a faculty yeah. member here, Donna Fennell, who does some in situ sort of physiological processes of, of microbes in the atmosphere. But it's a, it's a, hus it's a nasty place. Atmospheric ice nucleation happens up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. these guys. Yeah. Um, so here's a silly experiment. Can you do this? Take your ship and go into the middle of a bloom, middle of a bloom and pour some virus onto it. Will that propagate? Are you, first we of, can do, well, can we do can't that? do that no. like legally, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we do it on deck often. So we, when we go out to sea, we'll do manipulative experiments like where we're adding, we have an inhibitor that will induce or, or that will inhibit um, a, a key enzyme in our, in our infection is, is serine palmitoyl transferase, which is the, the first and rate limiting enzyme in the production of these lipids. Um, mm. There's a... So, so we have myria, myriacin, which is a fungal um, compound, is a potent inhibitor of that. So we can do manipulative experiments. We can add viruses that have different capabilities to water samples that we collect and we bring them on deck. And then we have in, incubators on deck that where we're simulating. But I've always thought, you know, there are harmful algal blooms. Right. Like Ariacoccus is a, is a brown tide that's, that forms off of yeah. Long Island, and there's a, a colleague, uh, Chris Gobler, who's up at, at Stony Brook. He studies the, the virus interaction, and one can envision, you know, you have the crop dusters of just sort of like viruses yeah. that can terminate blooms like that, potentially. You think, it would, you think that would work? I think it would work, yeah, absolutely. If you stack the encounter rates mm -hmm. by doing that, because it's concentration dependent, because then Possibly. you're going to have then you're going to have all this organic particulate matter. Is that going to be a problem? Do you think? Um, it might. I mean, eutrophication is a is a common mm -hmm. sort of process, right? Where you stimulate lots of organic matter, and then the microbes will respire it, and they may draw the O2 levels down. Didn't so that might be an issue. Remember, we sat near a eutrophic lake in Montana. Once? Who could forget? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different byproduct at that level. So, are you? Uh, tell us your concerns about the acidification of the ocean with regards to your organism. Yeah, so um, ocean acidification, for those that, that don't know, is basically a, a product of dissolving CO2 in water. I mean, you can do this experimentally. You can take a CO2 tank, take seawater, and we used to do this at Scripps to just prevent precipitation in our media when we'd make, make media, bubble it with CO2 and the pH will drop mm. dramatically. Um, and so that happens naturally. So as the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere increases, it's going to equilibrate with the ocean. And as you do that, the pH will drop. So right now it's about 8.2 typically. And so in the deep ocean, the pH is a little bit uh, lower. It's about 7.8. And that's kind of the projected... Uh, ocean acidification target. And so one yeah. problem with ocean acidification with the organisms that we study is that it'll dissolve the calcium carbonate and their, their frustule. Their, I uh, sleep over that. I honestly do. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Uh, and corals, of course, are the prominent cal uh, calcifiers on I the mean, planet. If these organisms are essential for cloud formation and they can't make a cockle with, yeah. then... Yeah. What happens to cloud formation? Then? Yeah, well, it's a big area of research now. So it's, one of the things that we have going on is trying to look at what does calcification actually do to, to cells and how does it actually impact infection, too. And so one, right. we, we look a lot at, um, as it turns out, those turquoise blooms that you see from space are actually indicators that there's been an infection because what happens, we've one of my grad students showed this, is that when you infect with a, a, cal a coccoliths, it'll induce massive shedding of the coccoliths. And that's cool, but what's interesting is the coccoliths themselves are really highly absorptive to the viruses themselves. They have high uh, adsorption coefficients. Mm. And so we're still trying to understand like, how this biomineral is actually dictating the terms of contact rates we think that those coccoliths might act as decoys to sweep free viruses up from the system, and then they're dense and they the can, absorption column. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but we have some evidence that cells, naked cells, do exist um, in in the ocean. They're slow. They're they're small percentage, but we have a lot of them in culture. Um, but as it turns out, they they can actually reabsorb the liths, and you can induce infection 
of a naked cell by absorb absorbing a lift that's already absorbed viruses to it. And so, so this dynamic at the, huh. at the base of this it really fascinating mineral is something we didn't expect. And it's, it's, it's part of the, of, of the oncology of these guys. Is that so if those lifts aren't there, yep. then that doesn't happen. Got it. So, that, so this, the calcium carbonate death zone, by the way, is that what you're looking at as a major carbon sink? The, no pun intended, the, but of course. Oh yeah, yeah. Down. So, the, so one of the things that we've actually discovered as well, and a classic view of, of virus ecology, is that they just burst cells open and release that organic matter, and it's respired by microbes in the upper ocean. But some of the work that we've done shows that that that's not actually true. That when viruses infect, they make cells more sticky, wow. and they aggregate into particles and the fact that they have these these minerals calcium carbonate is more dense mm. than seawater and it forms ballast and it can sink carbon into the ocean into the deep ocean so in that line of of reasoning infection actually can help for carbon sequestration and, and what is the recycling of rate of that once it reaches the floor of the ocean how often the ocean, What's the rate of putting it back into a, It depends how deep it sinks. So I mentioned 4,000 meters is average depth. If it gets that deep, it's there for 2,000 years. Yeah, so that's the mixing time of the ocean. It, if it doesn't get quite as deep, maybe it's a few hundred. Or it sort of depends on which physical layer you get. And then huh? come back as a volcano? Well, <laughs> it'll, it'll come back as a burp. As a burp. And that's one of the issues with geoengineering and using phytoplankton like diatoms and coccolithophores I, I, don't do to, it, don't to do take it. up more carbon and sink. Please don't do it. Because you have a problem. Fast forward the generations two millennia from now have a problem. But we don't That's have way to. worse than, but we don't have we to. Don't have exactly to right. yeah. We let them. So let's uh, move to diatoms. So you just published this cool paper, Silicon Limitation Facilitates Virus Infection and Mortality of Marine Diatoms. Mm -hmm. So tell us the story here. Wh so unlike the viruses that Kay was just talking about, the coccolithoviruses, diatom viruses were only relatively recently discovered, so 2000. Two, I think, was the first diatom virus. So they're they're fairly new. And one of the reasons they were only just recently discovered is because they turn out to be single-stranded RNA and single-stranded DNA. Are they circular viruses. or single? They're linear. circular, and they're the smallest viruses on the planet. So their they virion, virion they size is about twenty to thirty-five nanometers. And they encode. One they protein? code three, three, three to four open reading frames. So they have a structural protein, uh, a replicase, or or an RDRP, um, and then a hypothetical protein of unknown function. So there are both RNA and DNA versions. So there are the RNA, RNA have DNA RNA versions. polymerases, yep. and, the, and DNA, the DNA have replicase. They do. The replication associated protein. A protein, yeah, not a polymerase. Okay. Right. So they're cresses, right? They're cress. What are cress? They're water. water. <laughs> In Silicon Valley. <laughs> oh. When you roll your eyes, I walked I know into that it. one. That was a good one. Good one. <laughs> you can uh, grow diatoms in the lab and infect them. We can them. grow, yeah. So the isolation and cultivation of first diatom viruses in the early 2000s is what sort of set the stage for us to be able to start studying them. But. Um, you know, Kay would argue that the coccolithophores are the rock star of the oceans. I would argue that the diatoms are. So every every other breath you take is from phytoplankton, but every fifth breath you take is from a diatom. So you can, you know, count your, you thank your diatom. Absolutely. There are bumper stickers of that, too. I mean. yeah. <laughs> diatom. Can these... Can you do plaque assays with diatoms? We can. We'd usually do most probable number assays because diatoms mm -hmm. don't like to grow in on substrates. The ones that we okay. study, they're they're pelagic, so they like to be in suspension. So we'll do like most probable number assays, but very similar to plaque assays. Um, and that's that's actually what's really interesting. Diatom viruses have among the highest birth sizes on the planet. So about ten to the four to ten to the five viruses produced per diatom cell. And what's the volume of a diatom? Oh. So. They're about five, Tiny. well, they range. So the smallest diatoms are about five micron in diameter, but they can get up to a millimeter long. So okay. yeah, I don't know how to, we'd have to calculate the volume. I'm just curious how to compare it to a, a eukaryotic cell and a multicellular, I mean, the, the yield depends, I guess, on the size of the cell. So if they're bigger, you're gonna get more yield. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, so, um, but, 
And so they the, burst, they actually burst. These are lytic viruses, These are right? lytic, it, well, and the way we study them, <laughs> <laughs> they're lytic. <laughs> but um, there's probably a temperate nature to them as yeah. well. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't, we think about encounter rates not as much as K's group does, but, you know, thinking about sort of how these viruses find their hosts in the environment. But one of the things that we're really interested in is, and Kay kind of alluded to it, was this concept of whether viruses feed into this viral shunt where they actually take particulate organic matter. And instead of that particulate organic matter getting transferred up the trophic chain to higher higher trophic levels, viruses can shunt that energy away from those trophic higher trophic levels and back into the microbial um, loop. And so we call that the virus shunt. But counter to that is what has been referred to as the virus shuttle, which is the the concept of viruses stimulating export, either through particle aggregation um, of these ballasted minerals. So diatoms are also ballasted, they're, mm -hmm. they're glass. And so they're often associated with most of the export flux, particulate organic carbon export flux in the ocean. And so when we think about sort of carbon cycling, it's it's usually referred to um, in the in the sense of diatoms, just because their abundance and, and sort of their global distributions. And so, um, you you mentioned earlier. I thought it was interesting. You mentioned earlier about people not reading old old literature, right? And and we kind of joke around that a lot of students these days don't read anything pre two thousand five, like that. And that's even fourteen years ago. So I was diving into the literature. I'm writing this grant right now about the role of virus diatom viruses in either either feeding into the viral shunt and into the virus or into the virus shuttle. And one of the paradigms in marine virology is that viruses feed into the virus shunt. It's all about the shunt. But I started, and, this, and the first paper I published on this was in 1999, the concept of the viral shunt. And it was really interesting because it was a hypothesis. It was, <sighs> well, we see that viruses burst these microbes. And so that burst would release all these nutrients and organic matter. And so we hypothesized that viruses could play a role in the virus shunt. And very quickly over time, that became paradigm. The hypothesis mm. went untested and just was, that's how it was. And really interestingly, in that same decade of the 90s were numerous papers about phage, bacteriophage in the ocean, causing particle aggregation, causing export, leading to sinking materials. And, and the concept of the viral shuttle was, was, was born in the same decade. Mm. But for whatever reason, people really latched onto this idea of the virus shunt and that has become you know, yep. gospel, gospel. <laughs> yes. exactly. And so a lot of the work um, that we're doing and, you know, a lot of the work that Kay's group has been doing shows that the viruses can lead to that sort of stimulation of export. This particular paper actually corroborates the viral shunt, at least under silicon limitation. So what we see is when diatoms, they have an obligate requirement for silicon. They can't complete a cell division without building their cell walls, obviously, and their cell walls are made out of silica. So um, when they're limited for silicon, um, they become stressed, and then they're more susceptible to infection. And, and then infection can actually, uh, the, the background of silicon limitation actually can facilitate that mm -hmm. infection process. So, so most of these viruses, um, I'm sorry, most of these algae are in the photic zone. And there's something called Langmuir circulation, I believe, or something of, of that sort that I remembered from my ecology yeah. days. <laughs> and that keeps everything mixed around in a small, tight circle, right? Mixed so layer, it's yeah. not odd to find these encounter events more frequently than would be predicted by just knowing their densities, because the motion of the waves also, it's like having your own you know, little micro vibrator for your tubes. Um, well, we don't think about encounter rates, at least the, I think what Kay was referring to, he can speak to it, but I, we don't think about it in the scale of the, de the, the average depth of the ocean. We do think about it in the euphotic zones. Yeah, sure. So if you take the sure. you know, depth of the euphotic zone oh, yeah. and the concentrations of the viruses, even in that sort of circulation, that mixed layer, it still, it still is a problem. You probably have more to say about that. Yeah, so, um, so mm. when you inject wind into the system, Right, all currents in the upper ocean are wind driven. Right. Period, right? There's right. thermohaline circulation and then there's surface ocean circulation, which is wind driven. Upwelling is a, a part of that. And so energy is dissipated in eddies. And, uh, and, and the eddies, I mentioned mesoscale eddies, which are like hundreds of kilometers, Huge. but the smallest eddies are about a millimeter. That's the Kolmogorov scale. Uh -huh. These interactions happen below the Kolmogorov scale. And so that's. That's where you have laminar shear, which basically transitions, and then you, you, you continue to release that energy by heat. 
So it's not so much, you know, um, the, the turbulence that you're talking about, you know, down to the Kolmogorov scale, it can influence the distribution, but it's not at the scale where a host is interacting with a virus. It can, if you have heterogeneous distributions of which, like if you have burst sizes, it, like all the viruses aren't homogeneously distributed, then it can influence, those eddies can influence the distribution of the, of the virus field and the host field that are there. So, but you also so it's that, like it's a matter of scale. Yeah, again. and at that length scale, the viscosity of the fluid changes. And so we like to sort of right. talk about phytoplankton in their ocean world, experience it as if uh, like, a, like, a, a, like a tube of a, a bottle of molasses. And so phytoplankton swimming through the ocean is like swimming through molasses because that's where the viscosity mm. comes into so play. It's based on the Reynolds number. Right. Yeah, that's a so great So you know point. how hard it is to mix <laughs> molasses um, and, you know, to do it by wind uh, and, and things like that. So that would be... So can you set up wow. models of, the, of all of these types of things in the lab or do you do all of this in the field? Um, we do both. So we have, um, we have sort of model systems in the lab that we can do very targeted experiments. So that was actually how in that, in the recent paper that we published, we were able to demonstrate that it was specifically silicon limitation that was facilitating the infection. So we could go out, but we did also environmental studies where we went out and collected natural diatom populations and we can detect the infection. Um, we, we looked at the single stranded RNA viruses because as, you know, as, as Siobhan was alluding to, our technology isn't quite there to detect detect the single-stranded DNA viruses unless you're specifically looking for them. But we can detect single-stranded RNA viruses in using you know, RNA-seq or metatranscriptomics. So we can detect which populations are infected, but in order to make sort of, and we can kind of correlate it to other parameters, measurements that we make, but really to demonstrate that link to a specific nutrient and demonstrate that it's not because, because of something else, we, we do those in the lab. So we do both. But. How many species of diatoms are there in the ocean? It's that estimated to be about yeah, seven. over <laughs> seven. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. They're one of the most diverse organisms in the, uh, diverse phytoplankton in the ocean. I think there's estimated to be over 100,000 species. Wow. And what's really interesting, you guys were talking earlier about these, these viruses that infect one organism and then another organism yeah. and then another yeah. organism. And I work on these viruses that are very species specific. So you uh -huh. can take a virus of a diatom diatom species and try to infect 25 other diatom species and it won't infect. Wow. And so it's... Even strains. It can get down to strain, yeah, it's even to the wow. strain level. So if you take, you know, That's population incredible. of diatoms and pick out a couple cells and start cultures from each of those, some of those will be susceptible to the virus, some of them won't be. Some of them are susceptible to an RNA virus and a DNA virus and some are, you know, susceptible only to that DNA virus, but for some reason are resistant to the RNA virus. Yeah. Are there hierarchies? And we have no, no, host resistance and, and sort of mechanisms of infection are, are, we know so little compared to like the plant and the so animal. So there's viruses. a Siobhan experiment, passage them in different diatoms and see what happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, a, I have a little fun fact though. And so we often talk about the number of viruses in the ocean. Yeah. So 10 to the 30 right. is the number of viruses in the ocean. And I wanted to, I wanted to do a little thought experiment because we, we don't, we can't really detect the diatom viruses because they're too small to see with microscopes or flow cytometry. Mm. Um, so we can make estimates based on the, you know, what we see in burst sizes for the lab. And so 10 to the 30 total viruses in the ocean, bacteriophage, all the coral, any, any organism mm -hmm. that's living in the ocean. And I, so I did a little, th Kay and I did a little thought experiment last week because I wanted <laughs> to calculate how many diatom viruses on there are there and it, it comes if you take a really conservative estimate it's about 10 to the 28 so I'm almost the half the viruses <laughs> almost half the viruses yeah. um, are of the total viruses well we've missed that half the viruses right so, so we say this there's is in addition to the 10 this is to in the addition 30. to the Correct. 10 to the 30 so what's the sum now 10 to the third, 10 to the 58. <laughs> and how many million light years did you figure that in space? Does yeah, that go? so did Curtis already do that one? <laughs> well, someone did it. It's 200 million light years if it's 10 to the 30th. 10 to the 30 is, so it's 10 to the 7 light years. If, if, if you take all the viruses in the ocean and you, you put them side by side if in a string. If you take the 10 to the 30 viruses the in the, the 30, ocean. Yeah. That, That's 200 million light years. So that, and, and yet at an average size of 100 nanometers, right, say, right, right, there's a range. Sure. It ends up being 10 to the 23 meters. 
And yeah. so you got, it's about 10 to the seven light years, right? And our closest star to the sun is 4.7. Yeah, right. And then the okay. Milky Way galaxy is 10 to the five light years across. So you can put a hundred <laughs> Milky Way galaxies, but but Kim did this calculation for the diatom viruses. Yeah, I don't know if that's, I, we're, I'm still Just fudging on those there. numbers. It's like 4,000 Milky Way galaxies worth of diatom viruses. Yeah, so that's it's ridiculous. Yeah, so that's like putting, we talk about scales, that's putting viruses on planetary scales. You know what I mean? But well, I tried, they, so I tried to impress yeah. my 14-year-old with this statistic, like, oh, 10 to the 30 viruses in the ocean. And his question was, how many grains of sand are there on the planet? So I was oh. like, well, how many? 10 to the 18 grains of sand. Yeah, and right. then he's like, well, how many wow. stars in the universe? Oh. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Google. Um, and so Isn't 10 to the 10, 10 to the 15? 21, 10 to the 21 the... stars in the universe, 10 to the 18 grains. Yeah. Of sand. And you know, the number of uh, different genomes you could make from like a 10 KB genome is more than the v number of stars in the visible universe. I forgot the is number. Right? Yes. Wow. Higher than 10 if to you the could, 21. So in some viruses, you can change half the bases. So if you even figure half of a 10 KB genome, the number of different permutations <laughs> is more than the number of visible stars. I mean, I, these numbers are good because if you're talking to people who don't know, it impresses on the scale. Because 10 to the 30 means nothing, Nope. right? Yeah. Well, absolutely. and nothing to my son, yeah, but absolutely. when I told him how many grains of sand, <laughs> and then he was it's impressed. twice as many grains of sand. <laughs> and if you put it into, you could also put it in terms of carbon, right? So, like, oh, man, I think exactly. Curtis has done this. So, like, the equivalent carbon, <laughs> oh, just, of, just of the viruses, it would equate to about a million blue whales. Right. Essentially. And I don't know if there have well, been a million the, and blue the whales phages, on the planet. <laughs> the phages are thousand thousandfold more than the elephant mass. But I don't use that anymore because the elephants are going away, right? So <laughs> that's not so great. Oh, so, number. so, all right, let me get, get this. So now we have 10 to the 58 viruses. <laughs> don't quote me on that. <laughs> in the ocean. No, you don't want me Seems to quote that way. And so that, that is how many light years? She, she's shaking her. 10 you know? to the 30 oh. plus 10 to the 28 is still under 10 to the 31. Okay. okay. 10 to the 30 yes, you're right. right. Yeah. It's still yeah. less. So it's 10 to the 31, which is 200 million. Right, right light years, according to Curtis and some other people. It's That's right. All right. So it's, it's, so not it's much. still about a thousand <laughs> Milky Way galaxies. Yeah, it's still far it's, away. It's, it's amazing for something that you can't even see with the eye. All right. So you think the, you, you did in the lab these silicon limitation experiments, they make the cells more susceptible to infection. Mm -hmm. You think this is happening in the ocean, but you can't really prove it, right? It's very difficult to do. Um, so what's the big picture of this? Why would silicon limitation make them more susceptible? How does it fit into the ecology of what's going on in the ocean? Well, so, so, well, e eco like, so why are silicon limited diatoms more susceptible to infection? That's one question. And so that, yeah. so that's a mechanistic question. Um, and I, you know, we don't really know. One of, one of our ideas is that diatoms have the ability to alter the degree to which they're silicified. So they can mm. make thinner frustrals or they, what we call, the cell wall we call frustral. And if you've ever seen, have you ever seen an SEM image of a diatom cell? So they're very porous, right? Um, so they've garnered a lot of interest from like nanotechnologists and material scientists because they exactly. make these really patterned, um, right. you know, mm -hmm. three-dimensional structures. And right. so the pores are very small. And so we think that th that's one of the reasons why diatom viruses have evolved to be so small because they have to get through the pores. And what I think might, what we think might be happening is when the diatoms become silicon limited, in order to maintain maximum growth rates, they'll thin their, frust their cell walls. So they'll make a thinner um, cell wall so they can continue to divide. And I think in doing that, the pore size get, the pores get bigger and it mm. might just be a physical, the release oh, from a physical I, barrier. Oh, so that was one of the things yeah. diatoms for so long, we didn't sure. think they had, they were infected because we thought the, the silica wall was like an armor, right? It kept the viruses out. Um, and that might still be partially true. And so we think that just from a, from a less solicified cell wall, the viruses okay. are able to get okay. in. Um, but ecologically, yes. why it's important yes. because, well, because so diatoms, you know, are the predominant primary producers in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, they produce 20% of our global um, oxygen mm -hmm. and they have an obligate requirement for silicon. So understanding the factors that regulate how they grow 
either through their their dis through, through the availability of silicon will inevitably impact their ability to contribute to carbon sequestration. And so the reason we're interested in it is because they form that link between silicon and carbon right. biochemistry. Now your uh, coccolithophores, the, their walls are made of calcium carbonate. So if you deplete that, does that have, make them more susceptible to infection? Well, yeah. So um, I mentioned, unlike a diatom, we can render our cells naked. So mm -hmm. they, so, so these two organisms biomineralize yeah. differently. Yeah. So coccolithophores, and there are some cool movies out there online if you <laughs> want to check them out. But they make them, they take up calcium and, and, and bicarbonate, and then there's a deposition vesicle, and they'll make this little plate. So that it's like a series of plates. And you can see it forming and then it'll push it outside of the cell and then it'll start making another one and they like just a 3D stack printer. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right and so they'll just stack them and so um so one of the hypotheses for a long time is that like why do coccolithophores make these minerals why do silica why do, uh, diatoms make these minerals like what what function does it play in the coccolithophores it was thought that you know it forms a barrier it pr it, pr it protects against infection and mm -hmm. it protects against getting eaten because it's a hard mineral grazers have come up with their own types of counter measures to deal with it um, but one of the things we were able to experimentally show is that yes that the presence of that coccolith does delay infection pretty dramatically, but only for a certain period of time. And what's interesting as it relates to infochemicals that you were talking about earlier, what we found is that when you add a virus, it doesn't infect it right away. It, it'll infect a naked cell right away. The, the armored coccolithophore is protected for a while. And then eventually we see this, this shedding that I mentioned earlier, and then the virus can get in and it'll, it'll infect it and terminate it. But what we can do is we can actually about, so the it's, that takes about 72 hours. So at about 48 hours, you see the shedding. And, but you don't see death of the, of the hosts, right? Mm. And so what we can do and what, what we did do was at the time of the shedding, we can remove all of the material, viruses, hosts, co uh, coccoliths that have been freed. And you're just left with the dissolved milieu. And we can resuspend a fresh, happy culture that's calcified and it'll shed. And so there's a host, in, a virus-induced host infochemical that is produced mm -hmm. that is responsible for this thing that we see from satellites, basically, right? We don't know what that compound is, um, but it's kind of like a key that sort of unlocks that armor door. You, um, probably, you probably know some recent work in bacteria lysogen seem to be secreting a peptide that is informing other cells. Right. Yes. Right? So yeah, and they can also produce anti-grazing compounds yeah. too, which prevent totally. infected cells from getting eaten. It's yeah, yeah cool. exactly. So you're a diatom virologist, right? Even though you said you're not a virologist. <laughs> I study diatoms and their viruses. Mostly you're interested in the diatom, not the viruses. I was I got into it because I was interested. I'm interested in understanding, you know, diatoms' yeah. role in carbon cycling and silicon biogeochemistry. And so um, you know, so that was how I got into studying the diatom viruses in the first okay. place. So it's pretty cool to be a diatom virologist, I think, or a Emiliana or Coccolithophore viro or any virologist, right? <laughs> so yeah. some people have suggested that if you drag um, a mineral that could shed the iron molecule mm -hmm. in the back of a ship, you could watch the algal bloom follow behind that. Yeah. So that sort of jump iron. starts algal production, right? Iron, iron fertilization. fertilization. <laughs> yeah, and they've been working on iron this, the role that iron plays in this process, too, right. right? Yes. So we're told by the common literature, the popular literature, that the Sahara Desert plays a big role in yeah. this. It does. Because the Shirakos come over, mm -hmm. lifts mm -hmm. it all up, and however the winds will take it and it drops, that's where you're going to get an algae. Yeah, you Correct. can actually see that in satellites. When you look at chlorophyll images, exactly. you can see just along, you can see this like swath of cl rich chlorophyll in the in the water, that's and you fantastic. can just trace the iron this, deposition. This is an amazing planet. <laughs> but you can you also... You're the only one in the universe, by the way. Nothing else could behave this way. This is just so exquisitely balanced. But what's also cool is you can that's see that over geological time. So there's a link to ice ages, glacial, interglacial oh, right. periods. And so um, when we go through, we're in an in interglacial right now, the last glacial was about 18,000 years ago. Right. When you go through this oscillation during an ice age, uh, the planet is drier. 
considerably drier because a lot of the water is locked up into ice. And so there's a lot more deposition, natural deposition of iron. And so if you, we talked about sinking, right? And so that stuff ends in the sediments. The sediments are the memory of the ocean, basically. Sure. We can go down into the sediments and we can date, you know, the age of that sediment and then infer things as to when that actually was, was in the upper ocean. And so you can see these spikes in productivity or not that follow the glacial interglacial cycles, which is because of the iron delivery. Right. So yeah. when is the next glacier age? <laughs> glacial. <laughs> not soon enough. I don't know, actually. Um, <laughs> Being delayed. <laughs> probably, yeah, it's probably not in the foreseeable future, right? Unless Maybe we never. counter overcorrect with like geoengineering and solar radiation management or something like okay. that. All right, TWIV562. Virology at Rutgers, we need a title. Come up with a title, everybody. Um, uh, this is, you can find TWIV on any podcast player on your phone or tablet. Please subscribe so you get every episode and we know how many people are listening. If you really enjoy our work, please consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You could give a dollar a month via Patreon or PayPal. And that really helps us with our expenses and allows us to travel, this was cheap for us to get here, but sometimes we go farther and it costs a little more and we'd like to bring you cool science from uh, all over the place. Microbe.tv slash contribute. And questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. Our guest today, virology at Rutgers, Brad Hillman, thank you so much for uh, arranging and logistics for lunch and uh, being here. Thank you for coming, thank you for all you guys do for this, it's a, uh, it's a labor of love. And I second what you say, contribute on uh, Patreon, PayPal, uh, keep, keep this uh, thing going. Kay Beidel, thank you so much for coming here and spending two hours with us. My pleasure, it was Appreciate a lot of fun, it. thanks. It's, uh, we don't often talk about ocean viruses, it's pretty neat stuff. As I said, we're concerned with the lungs and the brain and the blood and <laughs> seems kind of trivial compared to the ocean, but <laughs> it's also important. Okay, Kim, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Tamatracon? Tamatracon. Tamatracon, oh, the accent is on the second. Tamat Kim Tamatracon, thank you so much thank for coming. You. And Siobhan Duffy, thank you. I learned how to pronounce your name a long time ago. <laughs> it, your practice is showing. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, of course, Dixon de Pommier, he's at verticalfarm.com, trichinella.org, and this is a really cool one, thelivingriver.com. He's a fisherman, and the living river is all about rivers and fish. Thank you, Dixon, for coming down. You're welcome. Uh -huh. I have easy pass. It was a sin. <laughs> <laughs> Brianne Barker is at Drew University on Twitter. She's bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> thank you. We have some books to give away.